and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Rafa Iqbal, and in today's show, we'll be talking about elections in a neighboring country, of course, a country where there are 970 million registered voters. As we know, it's the year of elections on 8th of February. Pakistan had the elections. Now we're moving towards the Indian elections, and we'll see, be seeing the American elections also. We'll, in, in today's topic, we'll be talking about uh, the different dynamics of the Indian elections. We'll talk, we'll talk about uh, the manifestos, um, of course, uh, by the BJP. And, uh, of course, we'll also be talking about the grand alliance that has been formed against the BJP and is being led uh, by the Congress. And, of course, uh, regarding that, we'll also be uh, talking about the political victimization that is taking place in India and, of course, um, the other aspects as well. Uh, how uh, the election is being conducted in its uh, different phases and how uh, there are uh, uh, how these phases are taking place how smooth is the election process and uh, what difficulties are they facing of course there was an an, um, an incident of violence as well in one of the states and where elections are being held and uh, there are also different dynamics uh, regarding the economy and the, the different reports as we know that the guardian and al jazeera had also published its report recently um, and, and I'll introduce our guests and analysts that we have in the studios with us uh, who will be talking about regarding the Indian elections. Firstly, I'll introduce Farooq Patafi, who is a senior analyst. Thank you for your time. And uh, along with that, we've been joined by Raja Faisal, who is a geopolitical analyst. Along with that, on, uh, on Skype, we have been joined by Dr. John Deal, who is an Indian human rights activist, and uh, G.R. Baloch, who is the former ambassador. Thank you all for your time. I'll start off uh, my conversation, our conversation from Dr. John Deal, and ask him what he thinks regarding the elections in India. Of course, uh, you uh, being an Indian human rights activist, you would know the ground realities there. And uh, we've seen uh, the recent incidents of violence as well uh, regarding the first phase of elections. What's your take on the whole process there? And Dr. Dial, uh, could you also address the matter of, uh, you know, Modi pivoting toward co communalization uh, suddenly after the first phase of elections? I think we live the reality and therefore I must remind you and uh, what His Excellency, the former High Commissioner, would affirm, Mr. Modi's campaign, when he first sought the Prime Ministership of the country in 2014, was based on polarization, was based on the most rabid communal diet times that he could. We would have thought that five years later, because he could claim some progress, some achievements, that 2019, he would go to the polls on the basis of his achievements. And lo and behold, 2019 was a repeat of 2014 and was rank communal. 2024, and now he claims to have a whole plethora of achievements, including cash delivery to women, to youth, to farmers, to everybody else, including tunnels and bridges and airports and seaports, huge roads. He claims all of that. And yet, in the 2000 election, 2024 election campaign, he seems to have no other methodology, no other card than what we call in India the communal card. Communal card in, involves abusing Muslims, maybe also touching about unkindly on Islam itself, abusing and threatening Christians or trying to buy up the leaderships, using all the apparatus of the state at his command, occasionally also trying to coerce Sikhs. This is his bag of tricks, and it would now seem this is his only bag of tricks when he appeals to his vote bank. His vote bank consists of maybe some aspirational youth, but apparently the core of them are people who think like him, who have been taught to despise religious and linguistic minorities, people who think India should hark back on some distant past, some mythological past, and plan a mythological future. So this is nothing strange in what he has done. What he has done now, on which we should be focusing internally, especially in India, is that he is, seems to be challenging the election code. Rules that have been set not in stone, but set in precept over the last 
1716 elections, that once the election code comes into play, you will not do the following thing. You will not use state machinery, you will not appeal on the basis of religion. And yet, he is appealing only on the basis of religion. The Ram Temple, the, uh, the Varanasi Temple, all the other religious issues, including issues like meat, on what he thinks is a holy day. And yet, as we know in India, Hindus come in such a large variety that while one group may be fasting and eating only fruit in Uttar Pradesh, in Bengal, on the same occasion, for the same reason, they'll be dining off the best fish that money can buy. That is the variety of Sanatan Dharma in India, of Hinduism. And that is a variety of, in fact, all religions in India, regional cuisine, all sorts of things. So Mr. Modi it seems to be saying that I will do what I say. The laws, the election codes are not meant for me. Right. Uh, and uh, Mr. John, you mentioned uh, that uh, you mentioned how they're using uh, how they're using this sentiment and how they're using the Hindutva ideology to garner their votes. But at the same time, there's reports uh, from The Guardian, there's reports from the Al Jazeera, which talks about how there's unemployment is on the rise. Sixty percent of India's literate population is unemployed. Uh, and uh, this uh, Hindutva ideology isn't going to feed their bellies. Um, what would you say about that? Do you think uh, the youth is going to uh, the youth is going to shun this agenda and think about their own futures? And by the way, you, uh, uh, Doctor Sab, uh, you also mentioned Banaras uh, uh, Temple. By the way, I just wanted to know, out of curiosity, whether they have started actually uh, uh, relitigating Mathura issue, Mathura issue, because that is uh, where they say that uh, Krishna was born. All right. All right. As, as you say, in Varanasi. They have started puja in the basement of what is the mosque. And, and I think this is the beginning of what is going to be a very bitter mm. process ahead. In Mathura, they have started surveys. In Bhopal, they have started surveys. And the courts seem to be, again, very benign. The junior courts and lower courts, including the high courts. And that is a matter of some worry because there is a law in India that as far as religious places are there, there is a limit. You cannot reopen cases after 1947. Otherwise, every mosque, every church, every temple, all of them would be in some crisis. People will be looking for on what bricks have they been made from and what are the ruins on which they have been built. So in, in the wisdom, and I would say in the great wisdom, the founding fathers and the early prime ministers and parliaments said that so far and no more. Bauri Majid happened. And then it was told to all of us that it is the last time that this will happen. And, and, and we thought that maybe it was the last time. But in the passion of the launch of the new temple and the whole theatrics that have been built around it, passions have again been roused. And uh, Banaras, Mathura, Bhopal, are, are all again in the news, much to the worry of us all. On the question of employment, and not only employment, on security nets, safety nets for Medicare, on education, higher education, scholarships, the whole plethora of development issues with which there should be a discussion. The records show it. We don't have to look at reports from The Guardian or any other newspaper. These are reports coming in Indian newspapers based on Indian data that life is not okay. A vast number of, of our youth are uneducated, are, are, are not getting jobs, who are educated. There's a, if there's a vacancy for police constables, millions of people apply. Our railway stations are blocked because of the number of people trying to catch a train to the center where examinations are to be held. You apply for an office assistant, a PN, as we call them in India. And PhDs will apply for the job. PhDs who should be teaching in universities, who should be carrying out reports. They want the security of a government job, which will be paying them 40,000 rupees a month, but will be secure because there is such unemployment. And more than unemployment, there is underemployment. 
when you find MSCs and, and engineers working on nearly menial jobs, they are cause of, of, of weeping, I should say. And, and, and that is uh, the situation. These should be the election points. These are the points that INDIA, the Congress, and the opposition parties are taking up. These are the points that Rahul Gandhi talks about every day, the Congress president, the uh, Bihar uh, former deputy chief minister, the Tamil Nadu chief minister, the Kerala chief minister, they're talking about it every day. And yet the discourse seems to be made to veer away from debates on development, on what you have done, what you have failed to do, into passions. If you are not eating like us, if you're not dressing like us, if you're not praying like us, you are against us, you are against the country. Exactly. Uh, 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 Rafe, with your permission, I would yes. like to go towards uh, Ambassador Baloch. Please do. Uh, Ambassador Baloch, whenever, of course, we talk about, uh, you know, Indian democracy, uh, of course, it is considered as, throughout the world, it is considered as one of the biggest democracies of the world. And, of course, it is respected by the Western world as well, just because of one reason. And that reason is that uh, it, its nature is of, uh, it's, it's sort of secular in nature. And uh, of course, all of the uh, you know minorities they are given rights, and uh, uh, you know they are given a right to vote as well. And their say, I mean, in past it has always had weight in India. But now, of course, after uh, two of the terms of BJP, uh, whatever has been happening in India, and now they are heading towards the third one. They seeking third term in India. Don't you think that today's uh, uh, India is fast? Uh, going away from its secular in nature and now when we have this kind of India would it still be respected in the same manner in the Western world as uh, one of the biggest democracies or it would be uh, soon turning itself into uh, you know uh, a, a sort of uh, a country that is being ruled by one party and that party is ensuring that uh, it's the country is not secular anymore and, whereas it is considered as Bharat and of course the Hindus are in majority and that is what uh, they want for their country uh, uh, thank, you thank you for being on this on getting me on this program mm -hmm. and it's always a uh, privilege to be with, with Dr. Dayal so informed uh, a scholar of world uh, repute and a man of courage and integrity. Keep the good work, Dr. Sam, for democracy and for the oppressed people of the of India and through it all over the world. Now coming to India, India since Modi took over, my first comment is we thought that Modi coming after from Gujarat from a chief ministership to become the prime minister of the biggest democracy would grow out of his mantle of being Modi of Gujarat or as has also been unfortunately termed by some analyst as the butcher of Gujarat. That is their view also based on certain facts. But should he not have grown to be the premier Modi who marshals the entire goodwill of the people, irrespective of the of of what his background was, number one. Number two, he should have embraced the soul of India. The soul of India is what Dr. Dayal was describing, a, a secular democracy, a pluralistic society, a kind of synthesis of diverse cultures, languages. I was reading somewhere in India, over 1,700 languages are spoken. And I think as that many cultures, they've been thriving on this beautiful land for the last several thousands of years. Unfortunately, here we see a dark chapter, unfortunately, which has been given a kind of a mirage of development of, of, of a India, which is competing with other other powers in the world, but we have to also see what are the moral bearings of those morals, uh, of those powers with which India is competing. So, unfortunately, India today, as we see, 
and as BJP and the Modi is is uh, uh, trying to get the third term, I think it's not me or somebody else who's saying, but some reputable institutions who do the survey all over the world. There's one in fact study that I happen to uh, see was by V Democratic Institute. And it very clearly says, and with certain methodology, that how India from a electoral democracy has moved to become an electoral autocracy. Hmm. It is very categorical and a very, very serious charge on it. But the charge, which is based on certain evidence, the evidence is that are these elections which are being held really meet those criteria of free, fair, and where they give safeguards to ensure that the elections are free and fair. And what are those safeguards? Number one, that all the uh, political parties and voters are allowed to participate without fear or pressure, as we see that there is the election with several uh, prominent opposition leaders have been arrested. The minority voters are threatened that if they come to the voting station because they know where their vote will go, their lives and their honor is not safe, number one. Number two, do they have equal access to media? No, not at all. The entire, unfortunately, corporate, Indian corporate controlled media is kind of an electoral machine of BJP. I mean, I'm sure you, Dr. Ab, you know it. I think over eight or ten movies were made in Bollywood prior to the elections on the theme of creating that cult of cult of Modi. You see what? I believe that intellectually, if a leader builds a cult, that is the basic denial of the democratic norm of giving people the right to choose the right person. Because when it becomes a cult, it's a blind faith on whatever he says, whatever he does. Hmm. Three, no, I'll just finish in two minutes. Hmm. And more importantly, which is the criteria on which this institute has termed India turning from an electoral democracy to an electoral autocracy is that equal opportunity to have funds to the opposition as well as the as well as the uh, government and a transparent system, as we know that the Supreme Court of India had had uh, declared unconstitutional the the ele the election uh, contribution uh, uh, law passed by 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 the BJP uh, controlled parliament in 2017. Yeah, exactly. So and what a fraud. There were 33 companies which contributed more than their profits. My goodness, just imagine, you know, during that investigation that came up. So what kind of transparency are we talking about? What kind of a, 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 a kind of equal uh, uh, playing field given to all the political parties? So I think there'll be big question marks, even if BJP wins or not wins, they're different question, but definitely there are already question marks on the very process of election that we see afoot in India. Question, uh, question marks on the process of elections in India. I'd like to include Raja Faisal and Farooq Badafi both and like their comments as well. I'd like to start with Raja Faisal and ask him. As we know, elections in India, as they near, there's an anti-Pakistan rhetoric that we've seen that uh, just increases with time as uh, the elections are nearing more and more. But now we're seeing it's a whole new narrative. It's, it's a Hindutva ideology that, uh, that only promotes Hinduism in India. Uh, altogether, so they're moving to. They're having a shift in their narrative, and it's becoming more and more. Um, uh, what should we call it? Extreme and radical. What's your comment on that? Yeah, but Rafe, this is obviously you know whenever I hear something coming uh, from the BJP leaderships and uh, of course uh, you know RSS, they keep on highlighting one single word, and that is this gus bethiye. The word they use for Muslims is gus bethiye intruders or somebody who were uh, mm. obviously infiltrators uh, within the Indian uh, you know fabric the social fabric of India they believe that all of them they have actually come from somewhere else I mean I'm a Muslim and my I can trace myself back to Chandravanshi 
uh, Chib Rajputs, and of course, we from all of our sides, we are the uh, you know sons of the land. Hmm. I mean, this land, of course, belongs to us. And if somebody says that a person with the name Raja Faisal is uh, you know uh, an intruder or a goose bat here. I mean, what kind of ideology it is? And I'm pretty much sure that there are millions of Muslims in India who actually belong to India since, uh, you know, I would say centuries and centuries and still they are being considered as, uh, you know, ghost batier. Ghost batier from where? Intruders from where? We are from here. You know, this concept of, you know, there are so many Christians who are actually from India and they trace themselves back to Indian, uh, you know, uh, Indian ethnicity. And of course, they are Indian, but still they are considered as, you know, oh, they are from the Western world. No, this is not the case. I mean, faith has nothing to do with the land itself. Hmm. People have changed their faiths with time. And it is uh, something which is natural. I mean, people got attracted towards the faith and they accepted it and they left their, uh, you know, forefathers' uh, uh, faith. And it has nothing to do with from being somewhere else, you mm. know. And this is, I think, uh, in today's India, India which, is, which needs to be understood by uh, the whole India and by BJ BJP itself and the kind of uh, Gharvapsi and uh, all of these, uh, you know, campaigns which were started by BJP and RSS, I mean, this shows that there is an element of hatred amongst them against the rest of all religions mm -hmm. uh, in uh, India, even the Sikhism. Of course, they consider that Sikhism actually, you know, came out of uh, uh, Hinduism, so they need to get back uh, to their uh, bases as well. And by the way, in, if we talk about, uh, uh, you know, Indian constitution, in mm. Indian constitution, Sikhs are uh, classed as Hindus. I mean, they are not considered as uh, any other religion. Yeah. They are considered as uh, Hindus themselves. So I think these are the things they need to understand. And I, 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 I was, I was uh, you know, so happy that uh, Congress actually, mm -hmm. you know, after this speech of uh, Modi, they have taken this speech and gone into, uh, you know, election, election, election commission. And of course, they are, uh, you know, taking Modi into cleaners and they right. want this to be decided. Why? Because this is, I mean, in today's India, in 21st century, hmm. in India, it's, it's happening. Hmm. And it's, you know, it's actually a, a, a sort of, uh, you know, in today's India, it's a war. War between, uh, you know, people who want to keep the country secular, hmm. keep the country uh, that has <coughs> space for all of the religions, that has space for all of the ethnicities. Hmm. And there is on the other side, it's RSS uh, and BJP that is backed by RSS and that Hindutva ideology that is making sure that they have to take the India back to the Stone Age and mm. they don't want to accept the other, uh, you know, ethnicities or other religions of the mm. world and they just want to purify today's India and they, be they believe that uh, as long as they having other religions in the country and uh, somehow if they are having all of the rights in India, hmm. then that India is not acceptable to them. This well. is, I think uh, this is something that needs to be further highlighted and it should be shown to throughout the world, all hmm. of the Western worlds, they need to look into it that this is not a small country we're talking about. This is almost one sixth of the population uh, of the country yeah. that we are talking about and that country is having nukes as well. Hmm. They have the nuclear power and their uh, uh, military might is one of the largest military mights of the world. And of course, they are quite capable of doing anything. And that country is being run by that, that kind of ideology. And this matter should be, of course, keenly looked into. And uh, if we want a safer world, then of course, there should be some kind of pressure uh, hmm. on, uh, uh, you know, uh, India, India, especially this regime, Modi's regime, that they need to fix themselves. Well, Raja Faisal, that shuns the whole Hindutva ideology. I'd like to include Farouk Badafi in the conversation and ask him uh, what's his comments regarding how the conversation has shaped up so far. And secondly, I'd also like to ask you that uh, 
since uh, we're seeing that um, the BJP regime has had diplomatic rows with Canada, with the U.S. regarding their, their activities in those Western countries, and uh, there's allegations regarding um, Indian extrajudicial involvement in those countries as well. Um, with that, do you think there's global pressure on India and the BJP regime, and uh, now that they face domestic pressure as well, they're getting further exposed domestically and internationally as well? You cannot actually change the entire direction of conversation. Uh, Rafe, we have to stay within India uh, to talk about what is going on, right? Mm. Uh, allow me to actually stick to that. Uh, but uh, regarding uh, what uh, Raja Sahib was saying, w w w what other luminar uh, luminaries have actually hinted at, uh, secular, secularism being under trial is a smaller issue, honestly. Uh, the, I'll tell you why. Because uh, since um, India is a huge country and it is very complicated, right? Mm. Since its start, uh, Hindutva or soft Hindutva has been around and because the number wise minorities are not in a position to get a government elected, that's why they are usually on the receiving end no matter what. Mm. Whenever, whichever government wants to divert attention, they can actually uh, placate, uh, uh, you know, communal sentiments and then they can go on. Mm. But at this moment, something else has happened. Uh, at the start of this election, but just before the election, Modi ji, when he gave interview to Newsweek, actually was talking about Vixit Bharat, that is developed Bharat, by the year 2047, especially because his previous promises did not materialize regarding, uh, you know, well-being of the people. Hmm. So uh, he chose a date that, um, by that time, uh, if he is alive, he sh uh, should have been or would have been for 120 years old. So that is the kind of promise that you can make and never worry about, right? B but it was initially about Vixit Bhatra. Hmm. Then India, Gad Bandhan started uh, litigating jobs and inflation. And after that came manifesto. Hmm. And in uh, manifesto was called Modi Ki Gat hmm. And uh, what is Modi Ki Gat Nanti? because uh, he has become, he has the brand recognition. So you don't need, uh, you know, Muzaffar Nagar uh, violence of 2013. You don't need Pulwama uh, to win the elections this time. Modi is kafi. And because Modi is guaranteeing that you will get jobs, you will get jobs. But something seems to have changed after the first phase. Hmm. Uh, one, we have seen how vulnerable election commission is. Uh, election Commission usually, and this is also a toll of what is going on at this moment, right? Uh, uh, institutional meltdown seems to be, uh, you know, uh, becoming quite visible. That's why nobody used to challenge or question Election Commission. Now people are even talking about EVMs, right? Electronic mm. voting machines. Mm. But what happened? Uh, when you talk about, uh, uh, you know, uh, the election situation or the first phase, the turnout was low, mm. especially in the constituencies where Narendra Modi or his party had swept only in the recent state elections, right, in Rajasthan for that matter. And all of a sudden there was this realization that something has changed. And what has? Uh, you know, you have to give credit to Rahul Gandhi. He was uh, uh, sometimes called Papu, sometimes he was called Shazada pejoratively by Modi ji, but he actually did something great. He actually walked through uh, the country and visited, for, you know, crossed uh, uh, 4,000 kilometers on feet. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, he went back and, uh, you know, carried out another yatra, uh, this time on vehicle, but he connected with the common men and asked, their, asked them what are the questions that they are facing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I, at the start of my discussion, I mentioned that secularism is not the issue. Uh, equity is. Mm. And how is equity <coughs> at stake? India, when you talk about uh, minority not being treated well, you become something of an autocratic or authoritarian state. Mm. But when majority is not being treated well, what do you become? An apartheid state. Hmm. And in India, what has happened is that there is an elite capture. Brahmins and the upper three castes, right? Baniyas and Shatris, uh, Raja Sahib's caste also. <laughs> right? uh, they have been uh, more or less around 10% of the entire population. Hmm. 
but they have been controlling the resources of the entire country. So when Rahul Gandhi comes back and he produces this magnificent manifesto, hmm. that kind of resonates with people. CSDS hmm. had conducted recently um, a survey, Lokniti CSDS, and it found out that 27% of people thought that inflation or for that matter unemployment was the biggest issue in the country. Mm. Whereas compared to that, Ram Mandir was only 8% and Hindutva was only 2%. Right? Mm. That, and then somebody from his own party, Modi's party, spoke about changing the constitution. Constitution gives guarantees to the Dalits and the vulnerable majority mm -hmm. who have been oppressed so far. Yeah. So if you remove that, things go away. So with that kind of a situation, the word is that the Dalit vote has increased and it is not going in the, uh, in the favor of Modi ji. Mm -hmm. So Modi ji, and this is the biggest technique that they have been using. Mm -hmm. There was a Mandal report, and Mandal report especially studied the um, caste composi composition of India. Because of that caste composition, they had to immediately go towards or pivot towards Mandir like Ayodhya, right? Yes. And uh, so that it becomes Mandir issue or Hindutva issue, the, and through that they can consolidate the Hindu votes mm -hmm. so that the victims of the operation don't right. realize that they are victims, they become part of the hunt of something else, that mm. is minorities. Mm. So this is the whole situation right now. But unfortunately, I think that uh, they have actually pivoted to this very late. Modi is, uh, unfortunately, Modi has a very bad poker face. Uh, Amit Shah has a better poker face. But at this moment, politicians should have been resorting to fake it uh, till you make it. Hmm. And Modi Saab has exposed his weakness by becoming too jumpy. And that is going to cost him the election. Or at least right. that is the direction. Very well put for Fadafi. I'd uh, like to ask uh, Dr. John um, how he thinks the Congress and Rahul Gandhi has, uh, is uh, giving or is going to give a tough time to the BJP regime. Uh, let me first congratulate uh, His Excellency as well as uh, two analysts for the deep understanding of the Indian situation. Yeah. Uh, you. you are not taking a partisan Pakistan point of view. This is what our newspaper write. This is what I write. This is what I speak whenever I speak. You got hit the nail on the head. By the way, at which point, Raja Saab may tell you, I have great respect for the Kshatriyas, for the Thakurs. They're quite a soul, and many of them don't like Mr. Modi here. The issue, as Farooq Saab has said, is equity, not communalism. We have no problem. How can anybody have problem with Hindus? It has always been, after partition, a Hindu majority country. Nehru was a Hindu. Every prime minister, barring Manmohan Singh, has been a Hindu. Most chief ministers of most states have been Hindus. There hardly has been a Christian chief minister, and maybe only two or three Muslim chief ministers in the history of India, and none for the last five decades. Point is not that. The point is because of his inability to really reach out and help a large number of people. He says, I don't want to talk of Dalits and tribals and religious writers because in my eyes, everybody's the same. <clears throat> but the Constitution, as an equity-based Constitution, says that the weakest have to be uplifted. They have to be given a base support. You cannot put a, a seven-month-old sort of baby, premature baby, at par with a full-term baby. Communities which are small financially, numerically, not in areas which are very fertile, need support. And that was the basis of a large chunk of articles in the Constitution which gave reservations to Dalits, to OBCs, to Christians, to Sikhs, to Muslims, and all sorts of other tribals and things. The education guarantees to religious minorities, for instance. They were basic instruments that in this vast Hindu world, how will Muslims and Christians and Sikhs bring forth the new generations? Therefore, they were given the right to organize educational institutions. So equity is built into the Constitution. And Mr. Modi is going against the Constitution. This is my point of view. The second, and I'll make two more basic quick points, is that 
Mr. Modi, what he is trying to do by building up a cult is also trying to break down the bipartisan or multipartisan polity of India. We are, as a democracy, as in Pakistan, as in the United Kingdom and the United States, we are a party-based democracy. We don't have a government party, as in China, and everybody else is immaterial. We, we governments change here, parties change here. One chap is in the opposition, next day is the prime minister. Those are peaceful transition of power. By building up his cult, he is in fact challenged the way the BJP itself has evolved. The internal democracy of the BJP has been challenged. Today, there is no poster other than Mr. Modi's poster. People don't even want, I cannot even understand who is their candidate. It's Modi ki guarantee. What does the local candidate promise to the local people? Nobody knows. Nobody seems to care. But eventually they do. And this, I will make my concluding point. Let us not go by the hype. If you are in India at the moment, and you should be, you should send your correspondence here, and I'm sure the government will do that. There is no way. To whom does it pose a danger? To the ruling party? Surely. Because you can't see a ripple. You see the Modi ki Garanti. You see the posters. You see on YouTube, first one and a half minutes taken up by a Modi ad on anything. Hot dressing, cooking, flower decoration. First one and a half minutes, Mr. Modi. They bought over every space they could. Uh, obviously, everybody is quiet in this. Apart from today, today opposition parties have appealed to the courts, have gone to the police to register a case against Mr. Modi for speaking ill of Muslims. This this shows that something is happening. Will it translate into war? Will it translate into something? I have to see. But going by the first wave of, of elections, which was almost a fifth of the whole country, it did not go in favor of Mr. Modi very much. Right, uh, definitely, of course, um, Vork Badafi, what's your views on what uh, what Dr. John just had to say and regarding the situation in India um, um, amidst all these? Whatever Dr. Saab says is canon to me. <laughs> so I'm not going to actually comment on whatever he was saying, right. but I would like to go to uh, go back to Ambassador yeah. G.R. Baloch. Mm. Uh, Ambassador Saab, at this moment, regarding, uh, you know, overall situation, we once again saw yesterday Modi actually drafting uh, to Pakistan as well. And it seems uh, Barack Obama has also actually mentioned that suddenly, uh, when it comes to Pakistan, uh, India becomes one nation. Uh, after that, perhaps it isn't that much. Uh, do you think that if, even if they want to make Pakistan an issue, there's enough time? Uh, because the first phase has actually passed and then there are still six uh, more but uh, one is uh, on 26th so that one is not that uh, that distant either <laughs> my actually uh, comment our immediate reaction is that bogies b o g e y and fictions they have a very short shelf life so whatever bogies have been put up as the winning horses by the BJP, including the Modi cult, including the communalism, including hate Pakistan and hate Muslims. I think they are coming down on the ground one by one. I don't know why, but I have started as I have uh, tried to concentrate more on the, on the society itself. I believe that Indian society is a resilient society. It would not fall permanently under 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 the under the BJP doctrine of, of communalism. They will rise. And believe me, when they rise, they'll rise so strong that it will really become a democracy, the parliamentary democracy that we all envision. You see why? Democracy, a parliamentary democracy and a success in India is very important in my view, view globally, because it was supposed to be a democracy, the biggest democracy, but if it well, really gots and distorts into something else, it is bad for democracy all over the world. As I said it earlier in some program, that the faith of the people into the democratic process 
and the parliamentary democracy is kind of uh, eroding because of the rise of certain these cult personalities all over the world and if really it becomes a permanent feature of the of the of the of the norm of the indian society which it would not in my view uh, the history this what tells me that but that is very dangerous so in my view it is a, not a challenge that a the quality of democracy in india has to be of that level as envisioned by those people all over the world who thought so far democracy is the best system that we have come up with maybe it is the not the best system but the best system so far invented by the humans to to govern themselves if that gets distorted in india it sets a very bad model and a very bad precedent so i think democracy has a has a stake democratic process as a process has a stake in what happens in india what kind of quality of democracy really emerges out of this pa parliamentary process of of elections so the quality the fairness of elections is very vital for a for the quality of democracy that we want to Absolutely. see in india and beyond ambassador sir i'm glad that uh, you're talking about the uh, parliamentary democracy as well there for a moment uh, in the recent past it seemed and uh, of course modi also actually tried to uh, perpetuate this impression that there is no cha challenge hmm. to his leadership uh, for coming from any political party and that's why he kept on actually shooting down whatever leader would emerge for example he attacked uh, repeatedly didi or for that matter mamta banerji and others but now suddenly they seem to be actually uh, targeting uh, uh, you know only one political party hmm. and i'm not merely talking about modi all his allies all people in his circle are focusing only on congress party does it tell us that it it represents some kind of resurgence of the other pole in the country because there have to be two poles to have democracy in the country is it a question to me or to doctor yes, yes. to me ambassador sir <laughs> i think you are more qualified to give a answer but I'll, I'll 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 try i'll try after you I'll same try. question to him as well yeah okay good so i'll try i think i would fault congress <laughs> in whatever failures in confronting the communalism pro projected and promoted by bjp you see it became so kind of family oriented maybe not from within they try to put up a a pal party elections and so on and so forth but we were expecting that congress would become the republican party or democratic party or the labor party of india it never became like that it remained a dynastic party so i don't know how will the how will they they break out of it so it is the failure of the congress which has given an opportunity to a to a cult like party like bjp to emerge and challenge it challenge it like hands down so i think if there is a reawakening in congress i'm sure is going to be a big challenge for bjp i'll stop here i would like to have listen to dr sir uh, yeah right no, dr bial uh, excellency you know renal this is on on the dot having been here and being a close observer you're on the dot but as far i'm a critic of the congress but you're forcing me into analyzing it and defending it you know for the congress the gandhi nehru family is both the glue and the cause of tension yeah right because it keep on it is a cause for which all of us say it is dynastic but on the other hand it is the glue and i quite agree with you why did it not rise and become the large democratic party of india this is gandhi was assassinated rajiv gandhi was assassinated jawahar lal nehru was the only person who died a natural death even lal bahadur shastri passed away very fast the builders of the congress post independence their careers were cut short tragically and and that allowed the congress to not really be able to build itself up it allowed its local regional groups to cleave off the trinamool congress sharad pawar 
all the parties are actually all the non lawyer parties are the congress party now station in various areas the satraps who were once supporting the center now are not there they are the own own rulers and they are not very long lasting either they end up as dynasties themselves which is another another argument and another debate but the congress like the biblical saying it has seeds everywhere it has seeds in the ground if the rain falls properly if the sun shines properly it can revive any time we have seen it in karnataka we have seen it in rajasthan we have seen it in himachal we will we'll see it at many other places we have seen it in kerala it started by kerala the state is ruled by the marxists but all the mps were congress barring one out of 20 so it is a party which has a potential when the atmosphere is dry when there's a drought it goes a bit underground tensions people leave it rats the sinking ship but when the situation comes it has bounced back after all the bjp was atal bari bad boy was a much taller leader than mr modi his government could not last 7 years the congress bounced back ruled for 10 years as of now as the bjp is there so i am not lost hope and rahul gandhi now has started showing even his critics are saying that man is something is standing up and and, and challenging mr modi man to man is 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 become a pugilist from a pappu from a pappu to a pugilist it's a vast transformation in the man in his party and in the way the opposition is now challenging mr modi he may be a cult he may think is invincible but brinda kara today went to the police station and said i want to indict this man file a case they go into the court they asked the 17000 people immediately posted a letter to the election commission to disqualify him i was among those 17000 it hasn't happened in india before we are challenging the man right uh, doctors they all are very articulate with your views but unfortunately that's all we have uh, that's all the time we have for today's uh, discussion i'd like to thank both of our guests who joined us on Skype Dr John Deol and uh, GR Baloch um, thank you both for your time and very articulate with your views of course and in the studios we were joined by Farooq Patafi senior analyst and Raja Faisal uh, thank you both for your time as well with that we conclude today's show see you same time tomorrow till then take care